We're going to do something a little bit different tonight, okay? We're going to step out of Hebrews for just a little while here, a couple weeks, and we're going to step into Galatians tonight, okay? Galatians, I might be just a little bit loud, Brother John, maybe. Am I too loud for you folks? I might get loud for you, all right? Um, But look at the book of Galatians here, written by the Apostle Paul. Praise God. And I want to look at a few verses, talk about a few things here tonight. Praise the Lord. Look at Galatians chapter 1, and uh, beginning to read in verse 1, Paul, an apostle, I like this. An apostle means a sent one, amen? One sent by God, sent with a message. Praise God, we got to have a message. Not a message of man, but a message from God. And we have his message right here, the Bible. We can preach and teach the Word of God. Just take what the Word of God says and minister it to people. Paul, an apostle, one sent from God. And he says this, not, not, not from men nor through man. That's not my calling. He's just saying, listen, my calling, did, my calling came from God. My calling did not come from a denomination, didn't come from man. Man didn't call me to do this. But God called me. He says, but through Jesus Christ. Paul has to defend his apostleship because there are people that are saying that he wasn't a true apostle because of this. He said, you did not see Jesus face to face. Uh, we got to read the book of Acts chapter 9. Paul did see Jesus. Amen. <laughs> he did see Jesus. How many know when you see Jesus, your life has changed forever? Isn't that right? Your life is changed forever. Once you have a true encounter with Jesus Christ, your life will be changed forever. He says, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me, he says, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. Boy, are we living in a present evil age? Why did, why did God the Father give His Son to die on the cross? To, it says it right here. To deliver us out of sin. To deliver us out of this present evil age. To deliver us out of bondage. God did not deliver us out of this to go back into it, by the way. He delivered us out of this to live for Him, to serve Him, to live a holy life, to walk a righteous life, and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. According to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Look at verse 6. I marvel. Now, he hits it right right away, man. He's not beating around the bush, all right? His greeting here in the first five verses, and then in verse 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel. I want to say something, and I'll get into this a little bit bit later, but I don't understand Christians today because to me and my family, doctrine is important. (laughs) Praise God. Doctrine is important that we have correct Bible teaching. That we are taught the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation, amen, and that, and, I, and that has to be important for the child of God. If I am a Christian and I love Jesus, I want to know what the Word of God says, amen? Okay, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you into a grace of, and, and, and you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, he says, verse 7, not another one, but there are some who trouble you, anybody ever trouble you before, <laughs> that trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ, twist the gospel of Christ, pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven, man, even an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Not just me, but an angel from heaven. As we have said before, now, okay, so he's repeating himself. Repetition is good sometimes. He says, as we have said before, so now, he says, now say again. So I'm saying it again. And it needs to be repeated over and over and over because we need to hear it. The devil is trying to snatch it out of you. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For, for, do I now, for, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. And so he says, look, it, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this to please men, Okay. He's, I'm not, that's not why. No, he's called of God, ordained of God. Uh, he has the anointing of God upon his life. And he does this for the glory of God. God has called him. So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, Galatians, uh, stepping into Galatians a little bit here and talking about this for a few minutes. And then in a few weeks, uh, Lord willing, we're going to come back to uh, the book of Hebrews. Okay, so the book of Galatians was written by the Apostle Paul, anointed of Paul, Paul anointed of God, anointed of Paul, Paul anointed of God, and it was probably written around 555 to 56 AD. Theologians do differ on that. Some think, well, maybe he wrote it in the mid 40s. Regardless of when he wrote it, I want to know, I want you to know that he wrote it. How do we know? Because look at verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man. 
So Paul the Apostle penned this anointed of God of the Holy Ghost. He wrote to the churches in Galatia. He says that in verse 2. The churches in Galatia. Now, Galatia, let's, let's just talk about this for a minute. You can look at the back of your map, in the back of your Bible. There are maps back there. So the, the Galatia is not a town. Galatia is not a city. Okay? It is a region in Asia Minor. A region. And like I said, you can look at the back of your Bible. They have maps there. Look at Paul's first missionary journey, and you'll see the region of Galatia the, we can say Asia, Asia Minor. So the region includes, of Galatia, includes towns like this. Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, Pisidia. And so if you'll read in the book of Acts, you'll see that Paul is going through these certain towns or cities in the region of Galatia, ministering the gospel of Christ. Paul went to these uh, area along with Barnabas and, 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 and planted several churches to this area. And people were being getting saved by the power of God. Lives were being changed and transformed. And people were being set free and, all, and brought out of all kinds of bondages and so forth. Uh, the region of Galatia was made up of people who were called called Gauls, or we can say they were called Celts, C-E-L-T-S, if you will. And so Galatia, the area was invaded by the Gauls around 281 to 278 B.C. That's a long time ago. All right, they, they came over from Europe or modern-day France, if you will, as we know it today. But in 189 B.C., the Romans came and defeated the Gauls. And so, but at the same time, the Romans allowed them to have their freedom. So Rome came and occupied the area just like they did in Jerusalem and so forth. And Israel occupied the area, but they can still live there and have certain freedoms. So in 25 B.C., the area of Galatia or Asia Minor became incorporated into the Roman Empire as a province. Okay, so just to give you a little idea of what's going on there. Galatia simply means the country of the Gauls. When you hear that, the country of the Gauls. Okay, so that uh, gives you a little bit of background and idea there. Now, the main theme of this, the, the epistle that he wrote here, is the defense of justification by faith. We are justified by faith. We're not we're not saved by works and so forth. Also a warning against reversion to Judaism and a vindication of Paul's apostleship. Some said that Paul was not a true apostle because he did not see Jesus face to face. But we know that Paul did according to Acts chapter 9. So this epistle has been called by some writers the Magna Carta of the church, if you will. The main argument is a favor of Christian liberty in opposition to the legalistic teachings of the Judaizers or the false teachers and so forth. And so that, that kind of, you know, the main words here, if you will, or the key words of this book would be faith, it would be grace, liberty, and cross. So I want you to notice that in six chapters, 87 times, the phrase is used in Christ. In Christ. That's a prepositional phrase. In Christ, talking about your relationship with God. Talking about being saved. Talking about being born again. You have to be in Christ if you belong to God. You have to be in Christ if you're going to be going to heaven. Amen. Praise God. In Christ, I'm saved. I'm, I've been purchased, blood bought. Amen. Glory to God. Three times you have the phrase cross of Christ, cross of Christ. And then one time you have the phrase in the cross, in the cross. Praise God. So Paul, Paul probably wrote to the Galatians while he was in Macedonia. It could have been when he was in the city of Corinth. Again, opinions do differ on this. It's not really important where Paul was at when he wrote this as the content of the letter. What did Paul say? What was he saying? And that's important. Amen? Amen. Praise God. God's good. Amen? So, so Paul, Paul writes, now notice this, when he writes this, and you can see the, the transition, he has the greeting in the first five verses. He's greeting them, he lets them know immediately that he's called of God, uh, ordained of God, praise God. God called him, not man, not denomination, no other apostle called him, not some other church called him, but God called him. So he has five verses, he gives a short greeting, if you will, and then, bam, he hits it in verse 6. He, really, he gets to the point, amen, right to the meat of the subject altogether. And so notice that he writes this with, with such a great passion. He writes this with an urgency, if you will. And you can see that. There's good reason for this. And the reason is because after Paul and Barnabas had preached the gospel or the true gospel of Christ to them and started churches, others came along behind them after Paul and Barnabas left and began preaching and teaching another gospel that sounded like the true gospel. 
It sounded really good, but it wasn't quite right. It had a lot of truth in it, but then it had some air in there. They accepted the truth, and then when the air came along at the end of it, they also swallowed that and accepted that as well. In fact, it had gotten so bad that, that the false teachers were trying to turn the people that Paul had won to the Lord against Paul as if Paul had become their enemy. And Paul said, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? How many times does that happen? Oh, yeah. Amen. <laughs> Listen to me. If you want the truth, then be willing to accept the truth. Because sometimes truth is hard to swallow. Sometimes it's hard to swallow. Amen. Come on, church. Amen. Sometimes it is. Amen. Yeah, give me the truth. I want the truth. And when that truth hits you and brings conviction, brings conviction, all of a sudden we don't want that truth. I want the other truth. What other truth? Truth is truth. Jesus is truth. Jesus, I am the way, the truth, the life. But I want the other truth. There is no other truth. Truth is truth. All right? All right. So Paul preached the truth to them. Sometimes we, we don't like it. We don't like it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do something. My wife is downstairs. I'm going to rat on my wife tonight. I'm going to rat on my wife tonight. And so yesterday she came home and, and she explained to me, you know, the little situations that she had when she was in town and so forth. And she came in after shopping and doing some errands and things like that. And, and she was just, I mean, she was, in, in a nice way to put it, rare form. Rare form. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Be careful. Praise God. Hallelujah. God's good. Amen. Love Jesus. Y'all love Jesus? My wife was in rare form. And uh, she was telling me about, you know, an incident and, and so forth and how she reacted to that incident. And if she wants you to know, I'll let her tell you. But nevertheless, and, uh, and, and so I said, well, that's okay. That's okay. Just let it go. Don't, 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 don't you know, get all worked up about that and everything. And, and so I can tell a little bit later she was still in rare form. And, and I said, sweetheart, I said, what, what's going on? And she says, well, let me tell you. I says, what is it? And she says, I feel convicted. I feel convicted. And I said, oh, I said, God's dealing with you about the way you handled a situation in town. And she said, yes. I said, well, she said, but that's a good thing. That's a good thing when God deals with your heart. That is a good thing. If you can do something and God, and you don't feel the convicting uh, power of the Holy Spirit and you know that it's wrong, then something's wrong. Amen. So praise God that there is conviction. Praise God that when we step outside the will of God. God does deal with our hearts. That means He loves you. Praise God. Amen. And I believe the closer that you are to the Lord, the more sensitive you will be to the Spirit and the convicting of the Holy Ghost as well. Okay? So praise the Lord for that anyway. But anyway, sometimes the truth, we don't want to hear the truth. We say we want the truth, but sometimes, you know, the truth hurts. Okay? So uh, now understand that this, uh, what Paul and Barnabas were dealing with here and what Paul was dealing with is it was a gospel that was tainted with air, with these, these false teachers, a gospel that was tainted with air. It was a, a little bit of truth or some truth mixed in with a little bit of false. It was the gospel of grace mixed with the Old Testament law, okay? And let me just say this, the oil and water do not mix, amen? Oil and water do not mix. The downfall of the church today is mixing Christianity with the world. This is a problem. We're mixing Christianity with the world. Listen, we have watered down the gospel. We have watered down the message over the past several, several years, the past many decades. We have watered it down to where it tickles the ears of the people rather than touching the heart of God. Amen. We really have. And we have mixed this over and over to where we've made an Americanized gospel, if you will. You guys were here. We taught, I think, six different nights on what it means to be a true disciple. That ought to deal with our hearts. What it means to be a true follower of Christ, a true Christian, a true disciple. But the downfall of the church is mixing Christianity with the world. We want to, uh, we want to satisfy the people so they'll come to church, so that they'll give and so forth. But I believe that if we'll be faithful to God, God will take care of the rest of that. Don't you? Let's be faithful to God. Okay, so what's happening in the church today, it wants the best of both worlds. But you, Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve both. The church has become tolerant with sin. It's become tolerant with worldliness. The influence of the world has made its way into the church, and the church should be the influence to the world. The church is the light of the world, and we are the salt of the earth, the Bible says. But if the salt loses its flavor, then it's good for nothing but to be trampled on. It's not good for anything. What good is salt if it doesn't have any flavor? Let me ask you this. If, fla if salt did not have flavor... If salt had no flavor, would you be putting it on your mashed potatoes? Nope. You wouldn't put it on your mashed potatoes. Would you put it on your salad? Nope. 
You wouldn't even pick it up. Why would you put salt on something if it doesn't have any flavor? What does salt do? It enhances the flavor that's there. It brings out the flavor that's there. Amen? Praise God. And then what I'm saying here is that salt on my salad makes a bland salad come alive. It makes it taste better. Right? I love mashed potatoes and gravy. I love it. Man, I tell you what else I like. Mashed potatoes, throw butter on it. Throw butter on it. Amen? And I love a pile of green peas next to it. Mashed potatoes, throw butter on it with green peas. And then I just cover it with salt and pepper. You try eating that without salt and pepper, it doesn't taste very good. But you put salt and pepper on that, and it tastes really good. It enhances the flavor. It makes a difference. Amen? When I go home tonight, hmm, I don't know. Might be good. <laughs> I want to say something here. We we are to make a difference in this world. Don't let that world make a difference in you. You you make a difference. Hallelujah. With the salt. Hallelujah. Praise God. You would you would enhance. You make a difference. You make an impact on the world out there. Don't let that world make an impact on you. Praise God. Amen. You know, I think about Elijah and the 400 prophets of Baal and and what what Elijah was really dealing with was a mixed religious system. You look at that. He was dealing with a mixed religious system. It wasn't that they could not worship God completely, but they just had to also worship Baal. Mix it up. You can worship God, but also worship Baal. No, my friend. How many know we have a jealous God? We serve a jealous God. There is one Lord, one God, one gospel, one spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. So that's the downfall, I believe, of the modern church today. We're trying to worship God and the world at the same time. We're bringing the influence of the world into the church and in our lives. What are we going to do about that? Well, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. Because this is important. This is what is hindering the moving of God in our lives. You want to see souls saved? Separate. Amen? Listen to me. Christians are called, brothers, Jimmy Swigert said this Sunday morning. Christians are called to separate, not isolate. We're not called to isolation. We're not called to be the Lone Ranger. No, but we're called to separate. Amen? What he's saying is, don't be like that world. Be like Christ. The Bible said, be holy for I am holy. It says, Lord, come out from among them. Be separate. Be separate. Be separate. It doesn't say be isolated. Are you following me tonight? We are to be separate. If we want God to move, let's get it back the way it's supposed to be. Let's get the church back on track. Amen? Let's follow the word of the Lord. Uh, look at Ezra. In the Old Testament, amen, if you have a green marker there, that's where it's at. <laughs> that's for my Bible anyway. All right. <laughs> All right. I got a green marker there. Amen. Hallelujah. You know your Bible, don't you? Look at Ezra chapter 9. Look at this. Look what happened here. Israel, Israel had already fallen into sin. God had brought them into captivity. God delivered them after 70 years of captivity. And so now, I mean, they're, they're on the highway of holiness. They're separated themselves. They're living for God. You, you would think that they would have learned their lesson. You thought that they'd know better. But you know what happened to them over time? They fell back into sin. What happened? How did they fall back into sin? How did Israel, after 70 years of captivity, you thought they'd learn their lesson? How did they fall back into sin? I'll tell you how. They become lax with spiritual things. They become lax with God. Amen? Lax in their prayer life. Lax in their word life. Look at chapter 9. When these things were done, he said, The leaders came to me saying, The people of Israel and the priests... And the Levites have not separated themselves. Boom! Have not separated themselves from the peoples of the land. In other words, from the world. From the worldliness. From worldly ways. With respect to the abominations of the Canaanites. And the Hittites. And the Parasites. And the Jebusites. And the Ammonites. And the Moabites. And and the Egyptians. And the Amorites. In other words, they did not separate themselves. So therefore, instead of separating and living their lives for God and God alone, they begin to accept the idolatry and idol worship of these other nations and countries because Israel did not separate themselves. He says, For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons so that the holy seed is mixed with the peoples of those lands. They begin to marry their daughters and so forth, bringing in their, their religious system, bringing in their, their, their idols and worship and so forth. Ah. Oh. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in this trespasses. We talk about the spiritual leadership of Israel. They are to blame in this. They are the ones that are leading this up. My goodness gracious. The pastors, the teachers, these are the ones that are causing this problem. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, So when I heard this thing, I tore my garment and my robe. 
and plucked out some of the hair of my head and beard and sat down astonished. Sat down astonished. He was repenting before God. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. Couldn't believe what he was seeing. But look, notice the response in verse 4. Look at the response. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting and having torn my garment and my robe, which, which was, uh, really is repentance before God. He's repenting for his people. I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said, Oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God, for our iniquities. He's, he's, he's pleading, he's, he's praying, he's interceding for his people, the people of Israel. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Grown up to the heavens. Israel was finding themselves in danger again, in trouble again, because they chose not to to separate themselves. Separation for the church is for our good. It's for our spiritual health. In other words, a believer should not marry an unbeliever. Now, what happens if two unbelievers are married and then one gets saved? That's different. That's different. But a, listen, we are not to be unequally yoked, the Bible says. A believer is not to marry an unbeliever. By the way, why would a believer marry an unbeliever? Isn't your faith important? Isn't your faith precious? Isn't God important? Oh, listen, I will change him. No, he will change you. He will change you. I will bring him over. No, he'll bring you down. We have to be careful. Okay? Praise God. If you're really saved, if you're really filled with God, if you're really filled with the Holy Ghost, and you're really mindful of God, and you're really prayerful, God will lead you to the right one that He has for you. If you'll wait, if you'll be patient, God will lead you to the right one. Amen? I mean, that's true. Praise God. God's good. Amen? God is good. The Galatians had received the true gospel of Christ, the gospel that delivers, the gospel that sets free. But now they're receiving and adopting another gospel as their own, as their own. And what it's doing here is it's bringing them back into bondage little by little. Catch this. The devil is so deceptive that they don't even know it. They don't know it. They are delivered. They are set free. They are baptized in the Holy Ghost. They are living for God in the Spirit. Their eyes are upon the Lord, living by faith. And little by little, these false teachers, the devil behind this whole thing, we're bringing them back into bondage. Get this. Religious bondage. It looked right. It looked holy. It looked like it was God. But it was wrong. It was wrong. Oh, my goodness. How can people... How can people who, who um, how can they leave a, a, a church that has right, correct, balanced doctrine to a church that doesn't? Why? How? Because the devil has deceived them, and sometimes he plays on the pride or the hardness of our own hearts. Why? Why would Pentecostals leave their Pentecostal roots? Why would Pentecostals leave their Pentecostal foundation to go to a church that does not operate nor practice the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Let me tell you something. That is important to me. Pentecost is important to me. Listen to me. God desires for us to be filled with His Spirit and empowered by God. God wants to empower His church. If you want to pray in tongues, pray in tongues. If you want to shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. If there's tongues and interpretation and prophecy... Praise God. We desire that. Slowly and deceptively. Slowly and deceptively. The devil tries to bring us back into bondage. Jesus came to set them free. That they might have life and have liberty in Christ. Galatians 3 and 6. Paul said this. He said, man. He said, I don't know what's up with you guys. <laughs> He said, what's happening? He said, I marvel. I marvel that you are, listen to this, turning away. You are turning away so soon from him, that's Jesus, who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel. How can you do that? How you, how, I just leave for a little while. I go down to the street to go to Taco Bell and I come back and you're worshiping and doing something else. How's that possible? <laughs> I just went to the store for a few minutes. 
Amen. Don't you love it when Israel came out of, and, and God delivered Israel, you know, and out of the Red Sea and, and delivered them from the bondage of Pharaoh and the Egyptians and so forth. Israel's delivered, you know. And Moses goes up to receive the commandments of God. He comes down, they have this golden calf. He had this golden calf. He goes to Aaron, his brother. He said, how'd this happen? He said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he said, the people, man, they gave me their earrings and all their gold and everything. I threw it in the fire and poof, this thing came out. <laughs> oh, come on, Aaron. Come on, you know better. Moses going, yeah, right, bro. <laughs> man. <laughs> Paul said, how, how did this happen? See, what Paul was saying this, he said, man, he said, look, guys, I'm surprised at you. I can't believe what you've done and that you have done this and that you are turning so quickly away from the truth. Truth must mean something. Truth is important to the child of God. I want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, right? Do they still do that in courts? Lay your hand on the Bible. They do that anymore? I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. yes. Amen. Get it back in the courtrooms. Get it back in the government. Get the Bible back. Get God back where he belongs. Get him back in our homes. Get him back in our hearts. Get him back in our schools. Get him back in our children. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. What were they turning away from? They were really forsaking the doctrine of Christ. They were not forsaking just the doctrine of Jesus because Jesus is the one who called them, of course. And if you reject the gospel, then you are in reality rejecting Jesus. Think about this. If you reject the gospel, then there is nothing else. Amen. Christ is the gospel. Amen. And to reject the gospel is to reject him. He is the gospel. Jesus is the good news. Amen. The angel came and told the shepherds, man, I got good news. Amen. Amen. A Savior has come, praise God. See, understand here that without Jesus, we don't have a gospel. Without the cross, we don't have a gospel. But yet, notice this, we're preaching a, a, a teaching today. We're preaching a gospel that has no Jesus. We're preaching a gospel that has no cross. Without the blood, you have no gospel. And yet, we're preaching and teaching a gospel without the blood. Because why? Because that offends the people. We're preaching a gospel and we're leaving the name of Jesus out. We're leaving the cross out. We're leaving the blood out because we don't want to offend the people. Listen, I went to a church in Texas and they didn't talk about Jesus or the cross or the blood. They had a watered down, some kind of something. Nobody saved, nobody delivered, nobody changed. Nothing about the blood. I walked out of that place mad, angry. That's what's happening. Mm. Paul, Paul, so Paul says, I'm surprised at you and that you have willfully forsaken the true gospel and you have adopted another. You have rejected the truth and you've taken another along with you. Another translation would be like this. I'm surprised at you. In no time at all, you are deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and now are accepting another gospel. Desertion. Rejecting something and re accepting something. You see, what these false teachers were doing, they were perverting. Look at verse 7. They were perverting the gospel. You know, I, I want to just say this here tonight. Man, is it hot in here? Is it just me? It, just me? It feels good in here? All right. If it's hot, hallelujah. <laughs> Turn that AC on. Boy, praise God. No, but, but <laughs> hallelujah. Let me just say this, that... That we, it's important, and it takes time to, to know what the Bible says so that we know what to believe, okay? It takes time. You're not going to learn the whole Bible in a week, in a month, in a year. It takes years and years and years to really understand, okay? I'm not saying it takes years to understand a verse, but I'm just saying that you'll never, I'll never know everything about the Word. You're always learning. But I think it's important that we understand what we believe so that we are not easily persuaded or pulled away from the truth. Okay? Nothing's going to pull me away from my Jesus. I don't care how good it looks. I don't care what the suit looks like, what kind of cologne they're wearing, what kind of perfume they have, what kind of jewelry they wear. It doesn't matter. I don't care. You're not going to pull me away from Jesus, from the Word of God, from His truth. 
We're living in a time when people have itching ears. If you don't give me what I want, I'll either go someplace that gives me what I want. I'll hire a pastor that gives me what I want. I don't care if it's the truth or not. I'll take the fable as long as you make me feel good and tell me what I want. That's the time. This is the day we're living in right now. Yes. All right. Yes. Yes. You see, what these false teachers were doing were perverting the gospel of Christ. Pervert means this, to corrupt. To to turn. To corrupt. To turn. Um, <laughs> a couple weeks ago, you know, I, I, I bring snacks and stuff, and milk or orange juice to a Sunday school class. And, and so we had some milk that was left over from the week before downstairs in the refrigerator. There's a half a gallon of milk. And so I thought, well, that'll work. We'll just, you know, maybe. And I looked at the date. And it actually expired the next day on Sunday. And I said, oh, it expires the next day. We better get another half a gallon of milk. My wife says, no, it's okay. It'll last two more days after that. I said, are you sure? She said, yeah, I'm sure. And so we went down there and the next day, and sure enough, it had curled. I don't know if they got the date messed up on it. I don't know what happened. But my son came to me and told me that the, the milk is spoiled. It's not good. Now, in the carton, it looked good. In the carton, it looked like it was truth. In the carton, it looked like it was right. But it had been turned. <laughs> it had been spoiled. It had been tainted, if you will. Amen? Can't always judge a book by its cover, right? Amen? I don't care how pretty it looks. What's, on the, what's the content of it? What's on the inside of it? Okay? So pervert means to corrupt, to turn, to lead astray. These false teachers, of course, were trying to corrupt the true gospel of Christ and turn these Galatians away from the truth. Now, you see, let me just say this, as I just said a few moments ago. It looked good. It sounded good. It tasted good. But it wasn't good. All right? It wasn't good. It will lead you to a legal bondage and ultimately would lead them astray, even to the point of losing their way with God. I know there are some people who don't believe that you can lose your way with God, but I firmly believe the Bible teaches that you can lose your way with God. I don't believe in unconditional eternal security. I believe in conditional, conditional eternal security. There are conditions. Amen. We are a free moral agent. You can choose to follow God. You can choose to reject God. You can choose to pick up your cross daily. You can choose to reject it. You can choose to fall into sin. You can choose to go your own way. How do you know? Look at Demas. Did not Demas forsake Paul? Having loved this present world, forsaking God, forsaking the gospel, living for his sins, living for his passions, living for himself rather than living for God. Sure, it's possible that a person can lose their way with the Lord. All right, you guys okay tonight? Doing good? Um, anytime that you add or take away from God's salvation plan, we frustrate the grace of God. We frustrate the grace of God. Uh, what these false teachers were really doing, they were enemies of the cross. Enemies of the cross because they were perverting the message of truth. They weren't saying you couldn't have Jesus, uh, but they were attaching things to Jesus to maintain their salvation, mainly the law of Moses. Mainly the law of Moses. You can have Jesus, but you must also have the Old Testament law. You can have Jesus, but you have to keep and uh, you have to keep and maintain certain customs, uh, rituals, and ceremonies. Also, especially circumcision. If not, then you can't really be saved or at least maintain salvation. You have to be a good Jew before you can be a good Christian, and that is not proper teaching, by the way. That's not right teaching. See, let me just say this tonight. To add or to take away from the finished work of the cross of Christ not only frustrates the grace of God, but it becomes a different gospel. A different gospel. Listen to me. There are a lot of voices today. There are a lot of messages. There are a lot of gospels today. There is the gospel of works. I, God brought me out of that, praise God. There are thousands and thousands and thousands, maybe millions of people that are in a religious system or a church that believes in a gospel of works. Work your way to heaven. If you're a good person, God will accept you. How about the prosperity gospel? All about money. All about money. If you have faith, you won't, you're rich. There's the Jesus died spiritually gospel. There's the penance gospel. There's the Mormon gospel. There's the Seventh-day Adventist gospel. There's the Jehovah Witness gospel. All have the name of Jesus in them. According to the Seventh-day Adventists, that um, 
<laughs> if you don't worship Jesus on Saturday, then you are of the Antichrist, the beast. According to them, we are of the beast because we worship on Sunday. Interesting, isn't it? People in bondage. And what these really are, let me tell you what they are. And it's sad. It's sad. Let me tell you what they are. They are perversions. This is a perversion of the true gospel. They might sound like they have some truth in them, and they do have some truth in them. Let me just tell you this. You don't need another Bible. This Bible is complete in itself. I don't need a Mormon Bible. I don't need a Mark Malden Bible. I need a gospel. I need the God Bible. Hey, man, I want the Holy Bible. I want the Word of God. I want what Jesus has here for us. All right. We have to be careful. Um, people portray somewhat to be the truth, but it's not the truth. Let's go to Second Peter chapter, chapter uh, 2. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Praise God. Amen? God's good. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's look at this. He says, verse 18, chapter 2, 2 Peter. For when they speak great swelling words, boy, they sound good. Man, I tell you what, that guy sure can preach. He sure can speak. He can, <laughs> amen. But it says great swelling words of emptiness. There's no power in it. It's just a bunch of words, but there's no power. Just a bunch of stories, but no power. I'm sorry, but... If I get up here and just tell story after story after story and I don't preach anything out of this Bible, go someplace else. Go to another church. If I just preach story after story after story and there's no meat in the Word, go someplace else because you're not going to learn anything. And how do you know if the stories are true or not? All right? Listen to this. For false teachers. He says, he says, for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, empty, there's nothing there. They allure through the lust of the flesh. In other words, they tickle the ears of the people. They give them what they want to hear. And so they're luring them in. It's like fishing. Have a lure. You have a worm. The hook is hidden by the worm, by the bait. Fish doesn't see the hook. He sees that worm. He's like, oh, that looks good. He lures it in. That fisherman slowly reels that in, moves that bait. Boy, grabs that hook. Got him, right? He said, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error... While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. Brought right back into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that is, they've been to save, they've been delivered, they've been set free, they are again entangled in them and overcome. He says the latter end is worse than the, for them than the beginning. They knew better. They had the truth. But they went back. For if, for it would be, have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered. And I believe there would be a greater judgment for them because they knew the truth, but they walked away from it. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb. Listen to this. A dog returns to his own vomit. That's nasty, isn't it? Isn't that gross? Why would a dog return to his own vomit? That is absolutely sick. That is disgusting. And a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. You clean that pig up, she goes right back into it. Why do you go back into the mud? Why do you go back into the bondage? Why do you go back into the sin? Why do you go back? God cleaned you up. God delivered you. God set you free. God sanctified you. God helped you. He delivered you. Why are you going back into the mud? Why are you going back to the vomit? That's disgusting. That's Paul's argument. Why are you going back? Why go back? This is good stuff. Paul's saying, this is the truth. This is what sets you free. This is what delivered you, praise God. Amen? Paul said this, if anyone preaches... Any other gospel to you than what we ha you have received, let him be accursed. In other words, let him fall under the judgment of God. Let him be condemned for that. You know, you can see how passionate Paul felt about this. He felt very passionate about this. And, and we as the church today should feel the same way. I mean, come on. I mean, it's like, we just, anything goes? No, not anything goes. No, the truth is important. Who are these false teachers? The Bible says, talks about their Judaizers. Judaizers were those who stressed the adoption of the customs and beliefs or the character of a Jew. The Judaizers were, were I suppose, maybe you could call them, I don't know, Jewish Christians, I guess, from the Jerusalem church who wanted to combine the gospel of Christ with obedience to the law of Moses. Someone said this, said, any approach to Christianity 
which rest upon rigid observances of external rules as a means of salvation is no better off than that which is the Galatians were in danger of adopting. All right, this is, this is, this is kind of interesting. The spirit of the Judaizers is much alive today. See, we have churches adding works and rules to salvation. Now, I've heard this. I've seen this. I've witnessed this. I, I've, I've, I've encountered this, if you will. Some say that you've got to be baptized in water. You're not saved. That is not true. That's a works. Baptized by water is right. It is of God. It's obedience to the word of the Lord. But being baptized in water does not save me. The blood saves me. The cross. Amen. I've heard some say that you must wear your clothing a certain way or you can't be saved. Now listen to me. We are to dress modestly. We are to glorify Christ. Don't glorify the flesh. All right. But the fact is the way I dress doesn't save me, doesn't unsave me, okay? But if I am saved, I believe that we will dress in a way that glorifies God. Some say that you can't wear makeup. Where's that in the Bible? My goodness. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Folks, I vote for makeup. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on. They say, oh, it's the spirit of Jezebel. Where's that in the Bible? Come on. You, have, you know, there's some that say you've got to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Or, you know, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. That is not true. I have met people that believe this stuff. They would say that I'm not saved. If I wasn't baptized in the Holy Ghost, they would say that I'm not saved. That is not true. That is not true. If you'll, if you'll look when Peter was preaching at Cornelius' house, the Bible said they believed they got saved first. They got saved. Then they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. They talked in other tongues. What about, what about when the Apostle Paul, when he ran across in Acts chapter 19, disciples of John the Baptist? Hey, what about them? Were they not saved for 19 years, 20 years? Think about this. What about the thief on the cross? He didn't have time to get down and get water baptized. Jesus said, today you shall be with me in where? Paradise. He got saved while dying on the cross. <laughs> Let me tell you something. We went into heaven. He was no longer a thief. He was saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. When God saves you, He cleans you up. When God saves you, He changes you. Everybody wants to hold on to the past, but not God. God doesn't hold on to the past. Hallelujah. He's concerned about the present and the future. He doesn't hold on to the past. He washes them away, puts them in the sea of forgetfulness. If God forgets it, then you forget it. Don't let the devil bring up your past. Remind him of his future. Amen. God delivered. God said, for God cleanses. Some say that you're not saved unless you partake of communion, the Lord's Supper, that that saves you. I have argued with these kind of people. I've argued with them. They do not believe. They say, no, you've got to take the Lord's Supper. I said, no, we're saved by faith. It's the grace of God, the cross. <laughs> they add things to the cross. These are things that they add. Putting your faith in Jesus Christ and the finished work of the cross is sufficient. Colossians 1 and 14 tells us that the blood is sufficient. The blood is sufficient. Jesus did it all. And all we have to do is accept what he did. Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Praise God. Oh, praise the Lord. Ah. Uh, being saved doesn't depend on how much you pray. Now, we should pray. All right? We are to pray. I'm not against praying. I'm not opposed to praying. Jesus says we ought to pray. Being saved doesn't depend on how much you read your Bible. But we should read our Bible. Or how much you fast. We should fast. How many times you go to church. We should come if possible. Every time the doors are open. These are good. These are right. These are Christian disciplines. But I do these things not to get saved. But because I am saved. Amen. If you do then to get saved. That becomes legalism. becomes bondage. Well, I've got to read my Bible 10. I've got to read 10 chapters a day. I'm not saved. I miss church. I'm not saved. Oh, gosh. Help me here. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You know, we have to be careful with this. We have to be careful with this. Very, very important. I didn't pray for three hours today. I'm not saved. No. No. <laughs> that, that brings you into bondage. That'll wear you out. That'll weary, that, that's, that's wearisome to a person, my friend. 
No, it's such a relief to know that I am saved by faith through grace. It's not of myself. It's not of my good works. It's not that. It's God and God alone. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm saved because of the blood of Christ. If I do these things or have to maintain these things to become a Christian, then that becomes legalism. That becomes legalism. The thing about Christianity is that it's a relationship. It's not a religion. Now that I'm saved, I desire to pray. Now that I'm saved, I desire to take communion. I desire to read my Bible. I desire to spend time in the presence of the Lord. I desire to worship now that I'm saved. Because now He has set me free. Jesus is real. Amen. Amen. They're not have-tos, but now they're want-tos. Mm, hallelujah. My grandma used to try to bribe me to stay awake, Catholic Church. She said, if you stay awake, now this is in the 70s. If you'll stay awake, I'll give you a quarter. Amen. <laughs> I tell you, you buy a lot of candy with a quarter back then. You stay awake, I'll give you a quarter. <laughs> I don't know, I, maybe one time I did it. I don't know, it was pretty tough. It was a long hour in my life. That's a long hour. I'm serious. She's nine. My grandma's 96 years old. She probably still remembers that. 96 years old. Long hour. 25 cents. I'll give you. Stay awake. But folks, when I got saved, when God baptized me in the Holy Ghost, you don't have to pay me no quarter. Stay awake. <laughs> He's alive. It's like fire. Shut up in my bones. <laughs> Holy Ghost fire. Shut up. In... I'm tearing it out. Terrible voice. I know that. But you, you got the lyrics. Amen. It's like fire. Shut up in my bones. Holy Ghost fire. Shut up in my bones. Amen. You don't have to pay me no quarter to stay awake. I'm alive in Christ. I'm awake and rejoicing in God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Saved by the blood of Christ. Saved. Redeemed. Bought with a price. Amen. Do you know that Jesus loves you? You know he loves you? You got to know, shout God, hallelujah, praise God. I'm glad I'm saved and I know that I am. I'm glad I'm saved and I know that I am. Oh God, we praise you. Lord, we worship you. Oh God, we magnify you. Oh Father God, I want to know the truth, for it's the truth that will set you free. I don't want to be brought brought into bondage. Oh but God, I just desire you to know you, to know your word, to know your voice, to know your presence, to know your spirit, God, to know the word. Oh Father, we praise you tonight. Oh, we exalt you. Oh, thank God that we're not called by man that called by God to do his service he called you out of bondage he called you out of darkness and you're a child of God you belong to God hallelujah you're in the family of God he grafted you in you're adopted in so serve him and live for him and rejoice that we can be used of God or that God would desire to use us God is so good we have a future we have a hope hallelujah we have a purpose we have a calling. And I want to fulfill that calling of God. Oh, Father God, we rejoice in the Lord. We praise Him. We exalt Him. We glorify Him. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, God, set us a flame of fire. Set us full of God and the Holy Ghost. I thank you, Lord. We praise you, God. We praise you, God. We praise you, God. We worship you, God. You're so good. You're so good. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be our God. Blessed be our Savior. Hallelujah. Oh, I thank you for your spirit, your presence, the opportunity, God, to minister thy word tonight. Let us live in that liberty. Let us live in that freedom according to the truth, according to the word of God. Hallelujah. Father God, I pray for a service this Sunday. God, in Sunday school, let your spirit move. In our morning and evening worship, let your spirit move. Let there be faith. Let there be freedom. Let there be power that comes from God, that comes from heaven. God, we just want you to show up in this place. You to show up in our services, God. I pray the name of the Lord that you would be glorified. We'll come with a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We'll come prepared in our hearts. I pray that you'll help us, God, to spend that time in 
sweet communion with you before we come this Sunday, God, I pray. And I thank you, Lord, for so great a salvation. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for the blood. I thank you, God, for who you are and what you've done in our lives. Bless these wonderful people now. Bless them, God. Keep them safe, God. Bless their home. Fill their home with your presence. God, I pray in the name of Jesus. Bless them. Strengthen them. Empower them. Help them. Touch them, God. Be with them in their thoughts, their mind, I pray. And I thank you, Father, as I pray and ask all of this tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming. (laughs) I didn't get to finish, but I'm finished. Amen. (laughs) Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful evening. God's good. Amen. (laughs)